Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our special Medicare webinar. Thank you for joining us on this cold November Oregon day. My name is Brent Huntsberger. I'm the former personal finance columnist for the Oregonian. I'm also a certified financial planner, and I help put together the Oregonian's annual Medicare guide. For those of you new to Medicare or those re-enrolling, we know this is a very important and personal decision for yourself or your loved ones. Over the next hour and a half, we'll be hearing from a team of Medicare experts who will explain the basics of Medicare, but we'll also get into the differences between Medicare Advantage and Medigap plans if you happen to be reviewing one you're already in. And then we'll go over new changes to your prescription drug plans. We'll be answering your questions after each presentation, and we'll bring both panelists back at the end of the program as well. So please submit any questions you have via our Q&A box. Just click Q&A on the bottom of your screen, and to ask a question, you type it in and then uh, into the Q&A box and then click Send. This program is for educational purposes only. It's not a sales event. We're not promoting any one product or plan over any others. The choice of the plan that's right for you is a very personal one and dependent on your individual circumstances, health, and providers. We recommend you speak with a licensed health insurance broker or trained Oregon Sheba volunteers if you want help making your choice. Uh, more on those options during this webinar. And finally, this program is being recorded. If you registered for this webinar, the recording will be emailed to you within a week. So you'll have an opportunity to rewatch and reabsorb all the important information covered today. And you can fast forward through my part. We're excited to be joined today by some very experienced and knowledgeable Medicare experts. First, we have Marcella Easley. She's a longtime volunteer with Oregon Sheba, and that's short for Senior Health Insurance Benefits Assistance Program. Uh, she works in Clackamas County. We also have Lisa Lettenmeyer, an insurance broker who owns Health Source Northwest in Tigard and she's a frequent speaker and presenter on Medicare in the region. So let's start our series of discussions today with the basics of Medicare for those who might be first timers, and as a refresher for those uh, rethinking their current coverage. Now, Marcella Easley was a paralegal before she became a Sheba volunteer. She also worked for Clackamas County Courts and retired from the Oregon Division of State Lands in 2000 as trust property manager. She's volunteered for the Sheba program in Clackamas County for many years, also the Clackamas County Money Management Program, and she's active in Oregon Old Time Fiddlers Association, the East County Community Orchestra, and two Mountain Dulcimer Music Clubs. Uh, she did not uh, perform the intro music today. Um, she says she loves helping people and enjoying music. So Marcella, thank you for joining us today. And before you get started on the basics, would you describe what Sheba is? I'd be glad to. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Brent. It's ex very exciting to be here. Well, um, Sheba is part of SHIP, <laughs> all these acronyms. Um, Medicare is the national program that offers counseling or one-on-one -on -one to people and, and their families <clears throat> about Medicare. <clears throat> Excuse me. They call it state health insurance program that the federal government does. We call it senior health insurance benefits in Oregon. We're all certified. We have to take a lot of training. We have to be fingerprinted and have background checks every year. We have to take all kinds of classes and be up to, up to, up to snuff on what we're doing. So there's a very intensive. We don't have any um, biased opinion about any plans. We, we cannot choose a plan for you. We cannot recommend a plan, even though a lot of people say because it's pretty overwhelming. But we're here to show you what's available, to give you the basics and give you information, and then you make up your mind. And that's what we, that's what we do. We love, we love doing it. 
Um, so let's let's begin. What is Medicare? So basically, it is a program it is a government health plan for people over 65 or if you're disabled after 25, 24 months. The if you if you are have end stage renal disease or if you have your, your ALS, then you can be in Medicare immediately. You don't have to to wait till you're 65. <clears throat> you don't have to be on Social Security to be eligible either. A lot of people think you have to take your Social Security, but you don't. You, you can go ahead and sign up for Medicare anytime. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, what is Medicare? The very you have when you turn 65, they call it your initial enrollment period, IEP. Medicare loves acronyms. You're going to see a lot of acronyms. So. When you turn 65, there is a seven month hug, what they call it, where you can enroll in Medicare. Say your birthday's in June. So you, your, your seven months would start three months before your birthday. So March, April, and May, if you sign up, your coverage would begin the month of your birth, which would be July. If you sign up in your month of your birth, July, then it would be effective the next month in August and every month after that. So July would be effective August and August is September and September will be October. So that seven month hug. So go ahead with the next slide, please. You don't have to take your Part B if you're working. And by, by working, we means actually um, quality, actually working because you're, you're under, if you're under a qualified plan that your company offers with medical and, and, and uh, drug plan, that is good as or better than what Medicare offers, you don't have to take your Part B. You should go ahead and sign up for Medicare though and take your Part A because that way then you're, you're already in the system when you, when you are ready to take your Part B. So you or your spouse are eligible to under your employer's benefit if they're offered that. You don't have to take, take your Part B when you turn 65. Um, a few caveats, you do need to have 20 or more employees. If you have, if your company has 20 or fewer employees, then if your company doesn't offer a health plan that is as good as Medicare offers, then they're what they call secondary payer, and they they may require you to, to take your Part B. So be sure and check with your employer if you have fewer fewer than 20 employees or enrollees in Medicare. If there's 20 or more, then the Medicare is what they call the primary. They pay first and your, your company's plan pays second. If you're on Medicare because you're disabled, then Medicare pays primary if there's, if there's less than 100 employees or enrollees. So it's a little confusing on that. But the bottom line is your company cannot force you to take Part B when you turn 65 unless they don't have a good pl a plan as good as, as, as uh, Medicare offers. They, they have to treat you the same as anybody else that's in their company that is under 65. But do always do check though, make sure, very sure that you, that your company is, has their plan as good as or better than what, it, what Medicare offers. It's, it's really, it's really crucial because if they don't, you could be penalized. So if you could the next slide, please. So, as I said, I spoke before, coverage is based on your current employment. That means active employee. It doesn't include COBRA. It doesn't include retiree or veterans. A lot of people think veterans, but it isn't because veterans only offers their plans to veterans. And it doesn't include employment or individual health coverage. So it's really important that you are actively working. A lot of people think when they retire, if they have coverage, it's, it's they can... They don't have to take their part B, but that isn't, that isn't so. Another note too, if you are on social security already, you will be automatically enrolled and you will get your Medicare card. Here again, you can choose to take your part B if you, if you want to. Okay, the next slide, please. So when they have what they call a general enrollment period, so if you didn't sign up for your Part B when you were first eligible with your, your initial enrollment period, then you can sign up for Part B anywhere from March to, to January, or, excuse me, January to March. That's what they call the uh, special enrollment period. 
If you do that, then your effective date would be the first month following when you enrolled. So if you enrolled in January, be February. Now, the, the key to this is though, if you didn't sign up when you were first eligible, you may have to pay a late enrollment penalty. And that can really be spending. It can be it's 10% of whatever the, uh, like 100, it's $161 this year. So it's 10% of that amount, the part B cost for the 12 month period every 12 months that you didn't have Part B. So if you wait for five years, you're looking at a, a huge you know, at 50% for 12 months of $164 or $161 or whatever the cost is, because every year Medicare Part B changes. So it's really important to sign up for Part B when, when you're eligible. So if you could, the next slide, please. So the premiums, Part A is typically free. That's your hospital. And that 40 quarters is around 10 years. So if you've worked for 10 years or 40 quarters, then you don't have to pay for your part A, your major part A. If you, if you haven't worked 10 years or have 40 quarters, then you could, you would be, you would, you would have to pay $278 a month for anything over 40 quarters. And anything over that it would be $506 a month. So basically, if you worked less than 10 years, you would be paying anywhere from $278 a month to $560 a month over what your, your premium is for that year. So here again, it can really get expensive if you haven't worked your 10 years. If the Part B is $164.90 this year, and Lisa will cover this, but if you, if you make more than that a month, then you may have to pay an additional amount from anywhere from 65, 90 up to $395 a month more than the 164 if you make a lot of money, but Lisa will cover that. So the next slide, please. The Medicare does, uh, if you have your original Medicare, if you don't have a Medicare Advantage plan or a Medigap or other plan, then uh, if you have just your red, and, your red, white, and blue card, if you have to go to the hospital, you will be paying $1,600, which is a deductible, that's an annual deductible. But you'll pay that, even if you're in the hospital one day, you're paying $1,600. If you're in the hospital 60 days, you're paying $1,600. So it's, it's one day through 60 days, you, you pay $1,600. And then if you're in there after 61 days, then you pay $400 a day for the first 61 through 90. And if you're in the hospital over 90 days, then it's $800 a day. And that's per occurrence. So if you go to the hospital this month, you'll be paying $1,600. If you go to the hospital in December, you pay $1,600. And in addition to the, the daily after the 60 days. But one thing, if, if you're in the 16, if you're if you're in the hospital for 59, 60 days, it's only $1,600. But if you're in the hospital one day, it's still $1,600. So it's really spending. Inpatient care in a skilled nursing facility for rehab, you know, like if you have any replacement or something, you have to go for rehab. Then you don't pay anything for the first 20 days. Then after that, it's $200 a day for the first, or from, from 21 to 100 days. And after 100 days, they don't pay anything. But here again, they don't want you in there more than 100 days. It's it's for, it's it's just long, it's not custodial or long-term care. It's just for, for, for assistance for recovery. So next slide, please. Medicare also pays blood transfusions for the for after after three pints. You pay for the first three pints. They pay for home health, and home health is for like when you have a surgery, if you have to have IVs or nutritional care or therapy, wound they'll they'll take care of your wounds or, or sores that type of thing. Injections they'll monitor your illness. It's it's just a, whatever you whatever you 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 not you're not sick enough to be in the hospital, but you still need health and. That's the home health. And they do pay for hospice. You don't pay anything for hospice. They do have limited benefits, but they're, uh, they're pretty generous. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> now your cost for your part B, uh, you're going to be 20% for everything that you do on your outpatient. Now outpatient is all your medical services. That's your doctor, your outpatient, your emergency room, your, your durable medical equipment, and your uh, ambulance and your Part B drugs. Now, Part B drugs is different than your 
Part D drugs, that's like infusions or other, other drugs that aren't covered under your growth plan. Now, you do have a deductible every year of $226 this year. Every year it changes. So if you don't have a medical, if you don't have a Medicare Advantage plan or a Medigap plan, you will pay $226 every year one time, but then you pay 20% for everything, all your services, and there's no out-of-pocket max. Uh, most of your Medicare Advantage plans or Medigaps do have a certain, if after you've paid like six or $7,000 a year or whatever it is, then you don't pay anything else at all. But with, with the original Medicare, there's no out-of-pocket max. Next slide, please. So Medicare Part D, drug plans. Um, here again, original Medicare does not cover drugs. So you do have to have a drug plan. And if you don't get a drug plan, you'll be penalized also. So you have a choice. You can stand, you can buy what they call a standalone drug plan. And that's for people who don't, who have original Medicare, or there are some Medicare Advantage plans that don't have drug plans, like private fee-for-service plans or Medicare savings plans or Medicare cost plans. There's not very many of those around. Most of your plans do cover, have drugs in them, but you'll need to purchase a, a drug plan. And usually you'll pay a premium anywhere from $30 up to over $100, depending on the plan that you take. And so you'll pay that monthly premium, then whatever the, the drugs cost, you pay that too. Like I say, Medicare Advantage plans, most of them cover drugs, almost all of them do either with the HMO, Health Maintenance Organ, or Preferred Provider Network. And Lisa, we'll talk more about those. Next slide, please. So this is what's confusing. The, the, the good old donut hell, it's still with us pretty much. <laughs> um, Medicare does not allow companies to charge more than $505 for a deductible for their drugs. Many plans, many health plans do not even have a deductible for the drugs, but some of them do. So if you have, if you have a health plan or a drug plan that you have to pay a deductible, you, you'll pay up to the maximum, which would be 505 as most. Then you're in what they call the initial coverage phase. And during that time, then you pay 25% of the actual cost of the drug and the, the uh, drug company pays 75%. Once you have paid $4,660, then you're in what they call the coverage gap. Unlike previous years, at least the companies still pay 75%. You only pay 25% of the retail cost for uh, brand drugs until you have paid $7,400 out of pocket. And then you're in what they call the catastrophic phase. And that's pretty catastrophic when you've paid $7,400 for drugs. At that time though, then you don't pay more than 5%. So generally you're gonna be paying $4.15 for a generic or 1035 for a brand. And a lot of your generics are zero anymore. I found a lot of drug plans, you don't pay anything for your generics. But the, the, uh, you, you only pay 5% and the balance of 95% is covered. So the donut hole, We'll talk more about that later too, but you know, under, under the, uh, the drug uh, plans that, that, that they're, they're going to do away with this. So the next slide, please. So all Medicare drug plans are regulated. The government does have a um, maximum they, they, that they allow uh, uh, drug companies to charge and they do have requirements under what they, what they can cover. However, the plans can still be different because every plan will have a formulary, which is a list of the covered drugs. They all have different premiums, deductibles, cost pays, and restrictions. They all have preferred pharmacies, and some of their customer services are varied. Now, the formulary is interesting because it, say, say you take a statin drug and say you sign up, you want to sign up for a health plan, check to see what they cover for, for their drugs because for instance, they may cover a certain statin, but, but not all of the statins, but they do have to cover, they have to include at least two of every, every formulary drug. And, uh, but when you're comparing plans, a health plan may really be good, it's like a Medicare Advantage plan, but their drug plan may not work so well for you. So it's really crucial that when you're looking at plans to make sure that, that you check to see all your drugs are covered. Next slide, please. 
Here we go. Well, Part D does have a late enrollment peak, just like everything else. It's only it's one percent for each month that you don't have coverage. Um, they base this on what they call the national base premium. Medicare has a base that they charge every year for, for drug plans. This year it's $32.74, but it does change every year. So 1% of that per month. So for instance, if you go two years without a drug coverage, a drug plan, then your penalty would be $7.86 a month on top of what you have to pay. So it's, it's important here again to make sure that you have a credible drug coverage. So next slide, please. To avoid, whoops. <laughs> we uh, need to go back to the next slide. We, we wanna talk about avoiding them to, to make sure that you uh, have, you have to, you, you can have 63 days. So if you have more than 63 day break in your coverage, that's when the penalty starts. Now, unlike uh, Medicare pl health plans, your creditable drug coverage can be from veterans and TRICARE and Indian Health Services uh, because they offer it to everybody. So if you have veterans and you've got a drug plan with veterans, that is creditable coverage. You make sure every year that your plan does have creditable coverage because these things change every year. So it's really important to check with your, your plan. Usually they send out uh, some information telling you what, what is offered every year. Be sure to read that, it's really important. So I think that takes care of that if you want to go to the next slide. Only it's um, leases. Um, Did we skip a slide? I'm sorry, I lost track. Yeah, uh, we need to go to leases slide deck. I think we were just going to stop here to answer right. some questions. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Nope. That's, That's okay. my fault. All right. Well, thank you, Marcella, for bringing us through. I'm bringing Lisa in here to answer some questions. Um, so, how much? Uh, well, first off, let me ask um, how much time does one have to sign up for Part B when they, when they first have to enroll? Is there a time window? Yeah, so at age 65, if that's when you're going to choose to enroll in Medicare Part B, you actually have a seven-month window. You can start that process the three months prior to your birthday month. So I'm going to use myself as an example. My birthday is in June. So when I turn 65, I'll be able to start my process in April, May, excuse me, March, April, or May. Anytime I enroll in those three months, my effective date will actually be June 1st. I can enroll in June, and my coverage would be moved to July 1st. And I still have July, August, and September to enroll to complete that seven-month window. Each month I delay, of course, my effective date is going to be the first of the month after. So if I enroll in July, it'll be August 1st, effective date for Part B. The seven-month hug is what we call it. <laughs> yeah, seven-month hug? Is that what you yeah. said? Okay. <laughs> the seven-month hug. <laughs> All right. Um, somebody asked if Part A just covers hospital beds, but it covers more than that. Um, I think you mentioned inpatient yeah. nursing home. Nursing care. homes, yes. Um, home health care and hospice, both are really valuable uh, benefits, correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. and the, the just to clarify, the home health benefit, it is specifically for people who are considered homebound. So yes. either there's a physical limitation that prevents them from leaving their home or potentially whatever's going on with their overall health, it's not safe or feasible for them to leave and get care. Uh, you do have to have that prescribed by your practicing doctor, which is typically your primary care. So if you've been released from a hospital, it isn't going to necessarily be the hospital doctor, but it's typically right. very short term, very intermittent, two right. to three times a week at best in your home. Right. But the uh, the one nice thing I've seen about the inpatient nursing home benefit is that oftentimes um, people who are discharged from the hospital need to have some re recuperation. Yes. And so they have up to 20 days to rehabilitate or recuperate in a nursing home or nursing care environment. Right. right. So the, the qualifier there uh, under original Medicare guidelines is that you have to have been admitted to the hospital for three days or longer. Um, and you are just there to rehab. If during that stay you hit a plateau or you're not progressing, uh, you may find yourself uh, having to pay full price for your stay. Uh, the first 20 days are no cost. 
if if you're still there, they actually allow for a rehab stay all the way up to 100 days. Right. Days one through 20 are zero cost to you under original Medicare. Days 21 through 100 have a daily rate. Um, if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, typically most Medicare Advantage plans do not require that you're there for the full three-day hospital admission to qualify for the skilled nursing rehab benefit. Um, but that is still the case if you have original Medicare or Medicare with a supplement. Okay, here's a good question. Marcella, why don't you take a stab at this? It's Leslie's asking, why do I need Part B if I'm a retired federal employee and I have health insurance from Blue Cross that is deducted from my retirement annuity? Um, the federal plan is, is different and you don't have to take Part B. Uh, they recommend that you do just in case for some reason that you lose your, your uh, other benefits because if you if you lose them, then you will have the penalty to play. But yeah, if if you if you have the retire the federal retiree, then you don't have to have the Part B. Um, and I think somebody else had asked if if I if you have a federal health plan and has drug coverage and you did not get Part D at sixty five, are you penalized? No, because that would be creditable coverage. And the same is true for a vet. So if you have VA right. benefits. Uh, a lot of people will buy, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll use the VA system, but maybe they want to go outside of the veteran system. So they may get a Medicare Advantage plan. They might enroll in A and B still and get a Medicare Advantage that does not have drug coverage. So it's a lower price way of buying a Medicare Advantage plan. And you can still use your VA prescription benefits. Um, and, and if you ever did want to join a Medicare drug plan, you're not penalized because just like the federal benefits, like Marcella said, the VA benefits act as credible coverage. Right. And that, that's a beauty because people, people can have their veterans benefits and, and Medicare. They, they, with the thing with the drug though, they do have to have the, uh, the prescribing doctor prescribe the drug. Uh, it can't be a veteran doctor. It has to be the doctor that the, the, the veteran doctor will prescribe the drug for the veteran hospital. But if you want to get a drug outside the veteran hospital, you have to have your other doctor sign it. All right, here's another question that's relevant. If you're retired but working part-time with your employer who is also providing full medical insurance coverage, are you still required to sign up for plan B? So that's about part-time work. No, because no. You're, you're covered, you're covered fully. So if you're an employee covered by a plan with 20 or more employees enrolled or the spouse of an employee enrolled on the plan, uh, generally speaking, I think in my 18 years of doing this now, there's been two times where it was beneficial for the client to sign up for A and B and have employer coverage, but typically that is not the case. Uh, the Part B premium uh, for this coming year is going to be $164.90. So typically people don't want to pay that as long as they have a well-designed group plan covering them. And a lot of times that's less expensive if the employer is paying a premium for you. Okay. So um, we have a question. Please explain the difference between Medicare Advantage and Medigap coverages. So let's go right into that, Lisa, if we could. That's for it, Lisa. the topic yeah. of, our, of, our, of our next um, uh, slide deck. Uh, let me introduce Lisa formally. Um, Lisa is, uh, has been spent more than 13 years as a senior accountant in the real estate sector before branching out in the insurance industry in 2003. She quickly founded her own insurance brokerage, HealthSource Northwest in Tigard in 2004, and, which, and she's been uh, doing Medicare uh, consulting ever since. Uh, when she's not in the office advising clients or speaking to groups about Medicare, she's, she and her husband are enjoying gardening, glamping, and traveling, especially to Disney parks. Uh, Lisa, thanks for joining us again for this webinar. And would you explain what's the main difference between a broker and a health or an insurance agent, let's say? Well, so an insurance agent uh, is just an individual uh, selling products, and they are typically going to try to get a contract either directly with the carrier or go through a broker like myself. So I'm what's known as an insurance broker. Uh, I'm the owner and the main agent, but I have other agents that are underneath me. So I help them broker insurance too. And then I, you know, I get my contracts either directly through a carrier or going through a field marketing organization, but I'm just allowed to have other people underneath me. So 
and you can sell more than one provider's Absolutely. product or recommend more than one provider's product, correct? Yeah. So if you're dealing okay. with what we call a captive agent, so there are some carriers that will have captive agents. So all they're able to represent is just that one carrier's product line. Whereas an independent broker like myself, uh, I do my best actually to work with as many of the carriers out there in the market as I can. Uh, I want to make sure I understand all their products so I can compare them for my clients but I'm not tied to any one carrier. I do not give one carrier credence over the other ones. It really comes down to what fits the client's needs, whether it's doctors, medications, travel, finance, whatever that might be. All right, let's kick off uh, Lisa's part of the show. Okay, so if I'm not, if my eyes aren't on the video guys, it's because I'm watching through the screen here. Uh, so we'll go to the next first slide. Okay, so one thing that's really important to understand is, uh, first and foremost, you're going to start with Medicare A and B, and we refer to that as original Medicare. Uh, so that's where everybody starts, and it doesn't matter which of the two insurance options that you may decide to go with, you have to be enrolled in Medicare A and B which means you're going to be always paying that Part B premium, whatever it may be throughout the year uh, or from one year to the next. So option one would be keeping Medicare A and B as your primary insurer. Uh, it's important to note that when that is the case, uh, under Original Medicare, you're able to seek care at any uh, provider or facility across the nation. Uh, you're not tied to a specific network or provider list. You do not need to get a referral. And then majority of cases, you don't even need to have a prior authorization. So with original Medicare, the only thing you're going to want to do is ask the doctor or the facility, do you bill Medicare? And as long as they say yes, uh, and you're there because of a medically necessary situation, then you're good to go. Um, but as we saw in the previous screens with Marcella, the if you just have A and B, you have these gaps. You have portions of these bills that you're required to pay. And there is no ultimate cap throughout the year. There's no protection to what you may have to pay. So for people that want to keep Medicare A and B acting as their primary, because they like the idea of being able to go to any doctor across the country uh, without referrals, but they don't want to have to pay for those gaps themselves, you can purchase what's known as a Medicare supplement, also referred to as a Medigap plan. So those two names are synonymous, Medicare supplement, Medigap is the nickname, uh, and what we can see with that is there's actually 10 different uh, plans we'll, we'll get to on the next screen, but not yet. Uh, and within each of those plans, uh, it will determine how many of the gaps it fills on your behalf. So depending on what level you want to buy, you can fill all the gaps or the majority or half of them. And that's up to you. Uh, then separately, if you want prescription drug coverage, you would buy that as a separate product known as a standalone drug plan or a PDP, prescription drug plan. And you'll see the difference. If you're shopping on Medicare.gov, it'll actually ask you, are you shopping for a standalone drug plan or a Medicare Advantage plan um, if you're looking up drugs? And so that's the difference there. And then the option two is uh, formerly known as Medicare Part C, but more commonly referred to as Medicare Advantage plan. So you'll see tons of advertising this time of the year on TV. You'll get a lot of marketing material in your mailbox, unfortunately, um, and a lot of that is directed specifically to Medicare Advantage plans. Here in the Portland metro market, we actually have uh, quite a few. In fact, as, as, as we go into 2023, there are actually 50 different Medicare Advantage plans to choose from. Most carriers offer anywhere from two to four plans. So we've got several different carriers offering multiple plans. So there's 50 in total to choose from this year. Uh, and as Marcella pointed out, you want to be very clear on your doctors and prescriptions, and we'll kind of come back to that a little bit. Most of the plans you'll see in the marketplace do include drug coverage. The ones that don't typically are bought by people who are you know, using the veteran service or they just don't need or don't want drug coverage or not concerned about the late enrollment penalty. Uh, the other thing that we'll see with these Medicare Advantage plans is that they're going to be bundled with some extra benefits. And we've really seen that grow over the last several years. Um, so you've got two different options to, to, to decide right up front. You can, in some ways, change uh, as years go forward, but going from option two to option one will typically require you to go through medical underwriting. Uh, and I'm going to, again, come back to that a little bit later. I want to be very clear before we move on from the screen. 
both of these options work very, very well. They just work very different from each other. And that doesn't make one right or wrong or bad or good. It's just what works for you. Um, so you'll you'll have people that'll say, oh, you have to do one or the other. Uh, you'll have friends and family saying, you know, this is where you should go because it works for me. This is a decision that's very personal, as Brent said at the beginning of the presentation. And this really needs to be made based upon your medical needs, prescription needs, your travel. Do you snowbird? What's your finances? And what we find might work for one spouse, if we're dealing with a husband and wife, may not work for the other spouse. So you can be in very much enrolled in two different plans. You're not going to be enrolled together like you would have been in the past with maybe an employer group plan. And let me interrupt for a second, Lisa. Yeah. That one, I did get a question early on about which Medicare plan makes the most sense for someone planning to travel extensively, both domestically in an RV and internationally on tours. So when I have a client who says they're going to do a lot of traveling around the country in an RV or they're going to be a snowbird, uh, I typically prefer to see them on option one, just because we're not worried then about a network of providers. We're not worried about can you go out of network or is there a higher out-of-pocket cost for going out of network? Uh, with both options, you are going to have uh, typically, in most cases, some coverage uh, globally, uh, just so to be clear, Medicare A and B by itself does not cover you outside of the country, um, but both option one and option two give you some coverage for a medical emergency only. What I tell my clients is if you're going to travel abroad, I think it's a great idea to always buy one of those travel emergency policies. Not so much that I have a huge concern about the medical costs themselves, because in other countries that's very low, but I'm actually more concerned about the potential for the emergency transport. So where did you get sick or hurt? Where did they have to take you? Did they have to move you again or bring you back to the States under a medical transport? And that's where you could suffer some costs. So I think uh, for the for, for the little amount of money that it usually costs for those emergency travel plans, I think it's well worth it. Uh, but you would have basic emergency medical coverage on either side. So, okay, let's go on to the next screen. So this right here is the chart of the current Medicare supplements that are offered in the United States. Uh, what we want to be clear on um, is number one, it, it really is Medicare who determines what plans are offered each year. And most importantly, within each of these plans, what portions of those gaps are covered. So if you look on the left-hand side under benefits, I know it's a little bit small and I apologize to get it on the screen. I, I couldn't do much better. But if you go down that left hand column that says benefits, that's actually detailing each of those gaps that Marcella had talked about, whether it's the Part A hospital deductible, the daily rate, the Part B deductible, the Part B 20% coinsurance, uh, you know, all of those costs are labeled the very bottom row is that foreign emergency travel. So some of the plans you'll see, not all, but about six of those plans do offer some emergency travel benefit. So when we go through these columns, um, you're going to notice that plan F appears to cover 100% of every single gap. And then, of course, the 80% of the emergency travel. The and I'm jumping ahead of myself here, but the plan F and the plan C, only people who became Medicare eligible prior to 2020 can purchase these plans. Um, anybody who became uh, Medicare eligible from 2020 on, uh, there's still eight left. And typically the most popular is a plan G. One other thing about these plans is that they are standardized. So it doesn't matter which insurance carrier you go through, it's gonna be the same coverage. What will differ is the carrier themselves. So the three things that I always focus on when I'm shopping for a Medigap plan for my clients is I wanna see some financial strength. So I use a software that, that tells me what their AM best rating is. So I want a, a highly rated company. I'd like to have some experience on their customer service. I don't wanna have difficulties for my clients when they go to use it. And then the third one I'm looking at is price. Because the coverage is standardized, It you know, as far as, well, if I go with ABC company or XYZ, the coverage won't differ, but obviously the price can, and certainly customer service and financial strength. So we'll move on to the next screen.
And this is just recapping what I had just said. So again, if somebody had be had turned 65, so your Medicare eligibility, generally speaking, is when you turn 65 the month of, it can happen sooner through a disability. Um, so if you are Medicare eligible prior to January 2020, you can still buy a plan C or a, a plan F, and a plan F had been very popular. If, again, you became Medicare eligible after that date, then the highest level of coverage, the most comprehensive, is going to be a plan G. Uh, with that being said, on an F and a G, they do have high deductible options. What this would mean is that basically for this coming year, if you were on a plan F, you are on the hook uh, for the first $2,700 of, of costs. After that, then the plan would pay 100%. Uh, with a plan G, uh, same thing. So the first $2,700 and then the plan would pay. Uh, we can go on to the next uh, slide. So the thing about Medigap policies that can throw some people off is that you really want to be focused on when you choose to enroll in that plan because you want to target it when you don't have to go through medical underwriting. So guaranteed issue is what we call this or uh, open enrollment. Uh, the first one, the most common one, of course, is when you're turning 65. So the the that seven month window, you are guaranteed issue. You can apply for the plan in the three months prior to your 60th birthday or you could apply, uh, actually goes a little bit longer than that. You can apply the month of your birthday and with a Medigap, you can apply up to five months after that Part B is effective. So that's your guaranteed issue at, at your birth month. Um, you have the same sim similar timeline if you get Medicare early because of disability. Uh, open enrollment would be loss of group coverage. So a lot of times if somebody uh, is delayed their Part B enrollment because they had group coverage, so now they're going to start the group uh, Medicare Part B. They will also have a six-month window, so the month of the Part B effective date, five months after. If they're already enrolled on Medicare A and B, and then they lose, and they also have a group plan, and then they lose coverage, they've got a 63-day window to get a Medicare or a Medicare supplement guaranteed issue. Uh, and then there's some other top opportunities. Uh, if you are on a Medicare Advantage plan and you move out of the service area or the plan leaves the market. But the thing about guaranteed issue means that the carrier is only allowed to ask your age, male versus female, smoker versus non-smoker, and of course, where you live, because there'll be some rate differentiation depending on what part of the state you're living in. If you are trying to enroll in a Medicare supplement outside of one of these typical guaranteed issue opportunities, you will go through what we call medical underwriting. And what that would incur is a series of medical questions on the application itself. Some carriers have as few as 10, some as many as 30 questions on their application. Typically speaking, if you answer yes to any of the medical questions, you're gonna be declined right there. We wouldn't even pursue that uh, application any further. If you can get past those medical questions with all no answers, then we would submit it to the insurance carrier they are allowed to review your medical records and they can look at your medication list. And then with all of that information, they would determine if you fit their risk classification. So generally speaking, if you're gonna try to enroll in a Medicare supplement plan, you really wanna target when you're guaranteed issue, not that you aren't gonna pass underwriting, but certainly as we get older, if there's medical issues going on, you are less likely to be insured. Um, so that's one of the key things. So if I've got a client who's brand new to Medicare and they're looking between option one and option two, I always want to make that very clear to them that, you know, at this point, they're guaranteed issue. In the future, they may not be or they might not pass medical underwriting. So we want to take advantage of that. Next screen. Okay, so Medicare Part C, again, referred to as Medicare Advantage plans. So this is very different. Uh, what happens is if you choose to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan, what you're effectively doing is you're taking the job of primary insurer and placing it with that, that uh, private insurance carrier. So if you go with ABC company, XYZ company, they now become the primary insurer. They're the ones uh, responsible for managing and paying your bills. Of course, they're not gonna do this for free. What actually happens behind the scenes as you enroll with a Medicare Advantage plan because Medicare will no longer be receiving and paying your bills directly, they actually in turn pay that Medicare Advantage company a set dollar amount per month to manage and take care of that client base. 
The carriers have to follow very, very strict guidelines from year to year. Uh, number one, they have to cover all of the same medical services that would have been covered under original Medicare A and B. They can't pick and choose what they want to cover. If it was a covered service under Part A or Part B, it will be a covered service under Part C. That being said, the carrier is going to look and feel, this, these plans will look and feel much like a typical health plan. You will have a provider network. So in our market, the two most common provider networks are going to be the HMO, which is a health maintenance organization, or the PPO. And so they'll differ in whether you need referrals or you can be seen in or out of network. Um, the carrier will then assign per medical service a cost share. So you might pay a copay, which is a fixed dollar amount, or you might pay a coinsurance where you're paying a percentage of the bill. But one thing that all Medicare Advantage plans must have throughout the calendar year is an annual out-of-pocket maximum. So that protects you, the consumer, from you know, being on the hook for an unidentified amount of money, like it would have been under Medicare A and B by itself. Uh, and as it says there, <clears throat> most of our plans here in Portland Metro do include prescription drug coverage. There's probably 10 that do not at this point. Let's go to the next slide. So talked a little bit about this already. Um, the, the thing to be focused on as you're looking at these plans, number one, when I'm working with a client, I want to make sure first and foremost that any of their established doctors are going to be in that provider network. Again, whether it's an HMO or a PPO, I want to ensure that my that the doctors are already in network. In addition, if that client is seeking care at specific hospital systems or diagnostic facilities, we want to ensure that there's, there's a continuity of care. So that's the number one. Secondly, as Marcella had pointed out earlier, it's a combination of making sure your providers are in network, but also making sure that your current list of medications are going to be covered uh, efficiently under that for that formulary. So, you know, is, are all your medications covered under the formulary? Are they affordable? Are they covered at a tier that, in, with a copay that you can afford to pay? So all of those things are things we're looking at. Do you I have a preference? Go ahead. I have a question. Uh, people have asked where you would find a formulary. If it's like if somebody has searched uh, Medicare.gov and didn't find that their medication was covered on, on the plan that they wanted or, or were already in, where would they look for the formulary? So generally speaking, if you're on Medicare.gov and you're searching whether it's a standalone drug plan or Medicare Advantage plan, you, you can put in your list of medications and the dosages Medicare.gov searches every formulary simultaneously for you, and it will show you a list of plans from least expensive to most expensive for your current medications and dosages. If you're not seeing a plan that covers, you know, a, any plan that covers your drug, that means that it's just not covered by any of the carriers. If you're typing your drug into that search feature under Medicare.gov and it doesn't come up at all, that means it's not under the Medicare approved drug list period. So Medicare has kind of a, a master formulary list. The insurance carriers are going to decide from that list what they're gonna cover under their formulary. They are required to cover a minimum of two drugs per treatment classification. And of course they can have some restrictions within those and they'll set the price points using that tier system, usually one through tier, five tiers. Getting to that carrier specific formulary, typically if you're on Medicare.gov, there's always going to be a hyperlink that you can go to the carrier's website or, or to the plan details. So a lot of times I've even played around with this. Um, you can click on that and then it kind of drives you down into the carrier's website. And hopefully at that point, you can see the summary of benefits, the formulary, um, get to a provider search uh, by doing it that way. Other than that, you would need to go to each individual carrier's website. So um, if you're not seeing the drug covered by any plan under Medicare.gov, that means it's it's literally just not covered. So, um, okay, so getting back on this um, with the Medicare Advantage plans, again, uh, generally speaking, what you're going to be dealing with is a provider network. Is it going to be an HMO, which is a health maintenance organization where you may need a referral and you really need to stay within that network because the only time you're covered outside of an HMO network is in the case of a medical emergency or urgent care situation. We do have quite a few HMO networks uh, as of 2023. 
that are no longer requiring a referral to go from a primary to a specialist. So that is something that we're seeing that's kind of being more common. The PPO networks, that stands for Preferred Provider Organization. Generally speaking, in a PPO network, you are not required to get a referral by the carrier standards. You can go in or out of network. You can self-direct to a specialist. The one thing I will say there is that sometimes you'll find a specialist who says, well, I actually want you to have a referral before I see you. So that's a provider requirement, not, specific, not specifically the carrier at that point. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing a lot with the Medicare Advantage plans that I mentioned earlier is additional services. So very, very common that most plans on the market these days have some form of a routine vision benefit, routine hearing, uh, routine dental, maybe a fitness membership. And then we're seeing additional services such as expanded alternative care because what Medicare covers in alternative care is very limited. Uh, we're seeing meal deliveries after hospitalizations or emergency alert systems, lots of different new benefits kind of come to the market each year. When we're dealing with Medicare versus routine services, I always like to clarify this. So again, Medicare A and B, uh, and whether you're using a Medicare Advantage plan, they have to cover the same services. When it comes to vision, anything medically necessary. So if you're being treated for an eye disease or cataracts, eye injury, that would be covered under a Medicare plan, original Medicare or Medicare Advantage plan. What isn't covered by Medicare is the routine eye exam to get an updated prescription for your glasses or the glasses or contacts themselves. In fact, the only time that Medicare will cover a set of glasses or contacts would be after a cataract surgery. With routine hearing, we want to think in the same terms. Is it medically necessary? So are you suffering from an equilibrium problem or an inner ear infection? That would be a medical necessity that would be covered, whereas a routine hearing exam or the cost of the hearing aids is not covered by Medicare. So again, many of the Medicare Advantage plans are helping with the cost of this. They don't cover the full hearing aid per se, but a lot of times they'll give them to you at a discounted rate through their provider system. Dental has been probably the biggest one in the Medicare new book. It'll say medically necessary dental. Uh, from what we've been able to understand, that would be uh, if you had a tooth decay that, that got into an abscess and it was affecting your overall health, Medicare would help with the cost to pull the tooth, but Medicare by itself does not cover preventative dental, restorative, comprehensive, nothing. So we are seeing more and more Medicare Advantage plans try to include at least preventative dental as a benefit. So that would be your basic two exams and two routine cleanings every year with some bite wing x-rays. Many times you've got to use that provider's um, contracted dentist. Um, so we're seeing different things in the market with that. Uh, some carriers are now expanding into both preventative and comprehensive. Some of them are allowing you to go outside of the network. So again, these are all things to be looking at if you're considering a Medicare Advantage plan, because it's great to get the medical and prescription covered but then maybe there's some other services that you'd actually use and need that, that could help benefit you. So let's go to the next screen. So uh, I touched on the first two already. Uh, when it comes to Medicare Advantage plans, usually what we're focusing on a lot of times is either the network or the type of Medicare Advantage plan. So we've got the HMO and PPO networks. Uh, what we've now got in the market is what's known as an HMO point of service. You wanna be a little bit careful here. Uh, we've had a carrier for quite a few years that had an HMO point of service, and the idea was it basically was an HMO that allowed people to seek medical care outside of the HMO under certain uh, uh, rules and guidelines. And that carrier still offers that plan, but we're seeing more plans this year calling themselves an HMO point of service, not because you can leave the network for medical care, but you can leave their network for dental care. So be very clear if you're looking at a plan that says it's an HMO point of service, is that point of service allowing you flexibility outside of the network for medical or dental or both? So good questions to ask. Special needs plans, there's two different types. You've got special needs plans for people who have chronic medical conditions and you actually have to qualify for that uh, with uh, certain medical issues. Or we may have what we call dual eligible plans. So for somebody who is a Medicare beneficiary, but also has Medicaid uh, benefits. So that's a dual eligible. Um, and and that, those are very unique, very specific plans for those clients. Uh, the fee-for-service, we do not have a fee-for-service in our market right now. Uh, that's basically where there's really no network. You can go to any provider or facility 
that agrees to, to accept that carrier's payment plan, um, but they can change anytime they want. The provider can say, I'm going to take it this week and not take it next week, but we do not have those in our market. We do have one carrier offering an MSA. That's a very unique kind of Medicare Advantage plan where you basically have a deductible and you are on the hook for everything, but the carrier via the government is going to give you some money per year to help offset that deductible and that money can roll from year to year if you don't use it. So that's a very unique concept. Uh, it just came into our market two years ago. So those are the different types of Medicare Advantage plans you may find. And again, uh, if it's going to include drug coverage, it's going to be a Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan or MAPD. Or if you see a plan that's only Medicare Advantage, it, it will specifically say it doesn't include drug coverage. And understand that if that's the type of Medicare Advantage plan you've purchased, you cannot typically go and enroll in a standalone drug plan unless you're on a fee-for-service plan or an MSA plan. That's the only time that you could have that type of a Medicare Advantage plan without drug coverage and then go buy a separate standalone drug plan. If you're on a typical HMO, PPO, HMO point of service or special needs plan and you need drug coverage, it's a package deal. So again, you've got to look at those doctors and, and the formulary at the same time. Let's go to the next slide, please. So Medicare enrollment opportunities, there's the initial opportunity when you're turning 65, uh, and it somewhat matches, of course, your, your uh, eligibility to enroll. So you can enroll the three months prior to your birthday month, uh, and it'll take effect on your birthday month, or you can enroll the month of your birthday, three months after. There's the annual election period, which is what we're in right now. It officially opens October 15th, and the, and the um, deadline to make any changes if necessary is December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. We can't, uh, as agents or carriers, really discuss plans for the following year until October 1st. And then um, from October 1st to October 14th, we can talk about everything, but we can't do any enrollment. So the enrollment actually can happen between October 15th and December 7th. And then for people who are already on a Medicare Advantage plan specifically, they get one more chance to potentially change their Medicare Advantage plan or leave their Medicare Advantage plan and go back to original Medicare and, and then decide if they want a Medicare supplement. And that's called the open enrollment period. It starts January 1st and it closes March 31st. So effective dates would be if you started in January or did your enrollment in January, your effective date would be February 1st and so on. But that open enrollment period is specific to somebody who is already enrolled on a Medicare Advantage plan and they either want to change their Medicare Advantage plan or go back to original Medicare and possibly pick up a Medicare supplement if they can qualify. So it gets confusing because this time of the year, we're also dealing with the open enrollment period for health insurance, which is pre-65. So don't confuse the two. <laughs> open enrollment in the Medicare world is specifically from January 1st through March 31st for Medicare Advantage clients only. And then you've got your special election period. These are typically going to be 60 or 63 days long. Uh, examples could be you've moved out of your service area for your Medicare Advantage plan, or uh, so you've got to buy a different plan. Maybe you weren't enrolled in Medicare Advantage yet or Medicare supplement. And so you've been employer covered and that employer coverage is leaving or you're, you're retiring. And so now you need to get enrolled in either a Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage. So again, loss of group coverage, uh, very rare, but sometimes the Medicare Advantage plan that you're on might leave the market. And when that happens, it creates a special enrollment period. Uh, other special enrollment periods would be somebody who became Medicaid eligible or may lose Medicaid uh, um, opportunity. So there's a couple different uh, special election periods. Generally speaking, it's a 60 day window. It's the, it's the month that it happens and then 60 days after. You really want to get some guidance if there's going to be a big life-changing event because you've got a very specific amount of time where you may need to change coverage and you don't want to miss that window because then you could lose coverage and you're stuck until the following annual enrollment period. Next slide. So Medicare Part D uh, and Medicare Part B and Part D. So we talked about that monthly premium for Medicare Part B and the standard rate each year does change. Uh, so, for example, this year, Social Security has been charging $170.10 per Medicare enrollee for their Part B premium. As we go into next year, we'll actually go down, which is pretty rare, but it's going to go to $164.90. Now, 
Now that is the base rate. That's what everybody would pay uh, with the exception of those people who are deemed high income earners. So how Social Security will review this is the year that you enroll in Medicare Part B, the federal government Social Security as they do the enrollment will look back on your tax return two years automatically. You don't need to help them do this, they have access. So for example, if I had somebody enrolling in 2022, I knew Social Security was gonna look at their, so their tax return from 2020. And if you filed as a individual or you filed married, they're looking at the entire tax return. And the number that they're focusing on is the modified adjusted gross income. So if you were single in 2020 and you uh, actually, I'm sorry, let me back up. This chart right here is for 2023. So let's use the 2021 tax return. So if you're enrolling or you're getting a renewal letter from Social Security for your 2023 Part B premium, they're using your 2021 tax return. For people filing as a single, if your income was over 97,000, you will face a higher Part B premium. If you're a married couple and your joint income in 2021 was over 194,000, then you're gonna face a higher Part B premium. And you can see the cost in that column right there, the Part B premium. So it can, it can get pretty high. It can get all the way up to $560. The other IRMA uh, is Part D IRMA. So this is only triggered if you enroll in a drug plan. So if you are deemed a high income earner and you enroll either in a standalone drug plan or a Medicare Advantage plan that includes drug coverage, you will also face a monthly fee that Social Security is going to charge you. And again, you can see the chart right there. Um, there is an opportunity. Let's go to the next screen. So IRMA stands for Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. So government likes acronyms, so it's called IRMA. And because they're using your income from two years ago, you can imagine that as we retire, our new income or our current income is going to go down, or maybe as life events uh, happen, our income changes. And we don't really want to wait for the full two years for them to catch up with our new income. So you can use this form. And the government files the form every year. They usually uh, send it out in December. Um, and that's where I find it is usually in December. I'll go find this form and see what the newest one is. But this is a life-changing event form. So you can fill this form out and ask for Social Security to reassess your Part B IRMA and your Part D IRMA based upon uh, you know, if, if your income dropped because of one of those eight categories. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Let's go to the next screen. All right, that's it. So we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. And we have a lot of questions. Let me go through a few of these. And Marcella, I hope you join join me in answering um during well let me let me move back here so um if medical under here's a question there have been a couple of questions about underwriting i think folks are confused on and i it's very confusing so this isn't to be ashamed or anything but if medical underwriting is required when switching from advantage to original medicare is there a way to know before changing whether a pre-existing medical condition will not be covered? This is somebody who's covered by PERS. So if the carrier accepts your application, if they take you through the underwriting process and they ask those initial questions, and then again, once we send the application and they have full opportunity to look at your medical records and uh, medications, if they accept you, they, they can't have any kind of pre-existing exclusions, especially if there was no break in coverage. That's one of the biggest things and probably one of the misnomers about pre-existing exclusions. It really only applies if somebody had a breach in coverage of more than 63 days. So if you went from having Medicare Advantage coverage that ended December 31st and you went through medical underwriting and you had a Medigap plan starting for you on January 1, as long as there was no break in coverage and they accepted your application and after the review, there wouldn't be any pre-existing exclusions. Um, here's another question, Marcella. During open enrollment for Medicare Advantage, if I switch to original Medicare during that period, would I be subject to medical underwriting? I think maybe Lisa had answered that, but if I'm not sure, what would you say, Marcella? They would. <clears throat> yes, they would. Because, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that gets confusing again. Uh, the annual enrollment period is really... The main thing that can be changed without any medical underwriting or questions is going to be the Medicare Advantage plans and the Medicare drug plans. Generally speaking, if you're going from a Medicare Advantage to a Medigap plan, so you want to go back to original Medicare as your primary and you want to Medicare, 
Medicare supplement or Medigap plan uh, in place, in most cases, you'll face medical underwriting. There are some unique opportunities that could afford you a guaranteed issue. But again, you want to work with somebody knowledgeable about that to see if that's the case. Would uh, a person have to go through underwriting if they moved out of the Medicare Advantage area that they were in and switched to Medigap? <laughs> no, because if they move, that that's that starts the clock ticking all over again. They if they start from ground zero. If they move to the other another area, then they they don't have to go through underwriting. Yeah, so that can be interesting. I've had people in the Portland metro area move to maybe the coast or to Deschutes County, and they were on a Medicare Advantage plan and they loved it here. But as they went out to the coast or to choose, maybe there wasn't a many, as many Medicare Advantage options or they were more expensive. So at that time, it made sense for them to go with a Medigap plan because their move created a situation where they involuntarily lost their plan. It just wasn't sold in the new county. That does create a guaranteed issue right for a Medigap plan. Same thing would happen, of course, if you moved out of state. Okay. Now, that's something to, to, to consider because in your metropolitan area, your Medicare Advantage plans will generally be a lot less expensive or more of them. I know I had some friends that moved to Gold Beach and much to their dismay, there were only two, two Medicare Advantage plans available. <laughs> so like you say, they don't, their best option was to get a Medicare app at that choice. <laughs> so where you live and, you know, in different, different states too, because California, for instance, Los Angeles, there, my sister has a plan there and she hardly pays anything for anything. There again, your population base. So yeah. yeah. Now here's somebody asking, if I don't want to add the dental vision or hearing in original Medicare, would I pay a penalty if I added it later or would there be a waiting period? Let's clarify so there, that a little bit. Yeah, so original Medicare, Medicare A and B does not come with or cover any kind of routine vision, hearing or dental. Um, and if you wanted to add those on, that would be you as a consumer looking for a standalone insurance product, like a standalone dental plan or a standalone vision. Uh, and that has nothing to do with Medicare. So there's no delayed in enrollment penalties, just trying to find a plan. If you do that, that actually is going to give you some benefits and not have any crazy waiting periods. Um, but again, Medicare does not cover those routine services. So the things that you're facing as far as penalties specifically is a late enrollment to Part B if you did not have employer coverage to waive that penalty or not having enrolled in a drug plan when you became Medicare eligible and you didn't have another plan that was credible like an employer plan or a VA benefit. But, but if you were enrolled in original Medicare Parts A and B, there's no penalty to then enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan that has uh, dental no. or hearing. You no. just may pay an extra uh, premium every month. Correct. To get that plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Somebody, uh, somebody asked, what does it mean to have a choice POS plan? My father has Medicare Advantage group plan through his prior employer, and he has an additional individual choice POS provided as a benefit from my mother's prior employer. So there's a carrier on the market that actually sells a plan called a choice HMO point of service. Um, and again, it's, it's designed to be an HMO network, but that point of service does allow that consumer to go outside of the network to, per, to, to use other services, like services outside of the network. Um, so if that's what they're referring to, that could be the same case. If not, you really want to check in with that carrier and be very specific on what does that mean for access to, to providers. And, then, and generally, they'll pay um, more for their services when they go outside the service like that, too. Yep. Um, do any of the Medicare supplement or Medigap plans include dental and hearing? No. No. Okay. Some carriers may give you some discounts. They'll have discount programs for vision and hearing and gym memberships. But typically speaking, discount programs don't work great as far as an actual benefit. Uh, but no, you're not going to see uh, dental or hearing or vision routine services included in a Medigap plan. I do encourage people to look for coupons. If they take an expensive drug, it's been my experience a lot of times I've been able to find some really good rates with the coupons or sometimes the manufacturers will give a discount for certain drugs too. But uh, it's amazing how like uh, your uh, coupons that you can get to help with your defer your costs. Yeah, we had a comment from somebody that says they only have a couple daily prescription drugs and he's found that GoodRx is much cheaper right. than insurance coverage. That's true. Okay. Yeah. 
It can be in certain areas. If you've got an expensive brand name, GoodRx isn't going to really help out much with that. Um, so no. the challenge to it becomes, you know, do I do I buy a drug plan? Uh, certainly with a Medicare Advantage, if, if we've got so many zero premium plans, we've we've you know got over ten of them this year. So if you've got Medicare A and B only, and you've got these, you know, gaps that you're responsible for with no cap, you've got no drug coverage. If you're a really healthy individual, you may very well want to go with a Medicare Advantage plan, especially a zero premium. It's not costing you anything additional monthly, but you're now putting a cap on your out-of-pocket exposure and you're typically bringing in that prescription drug component and maybe some other services that you didn't have before. I guess the other question that raises is, okay, so if you decide at, after you become eligible for Medicare to not get a Part D plan because you're using uh, coupons from GoodRx, at some point, you may run into prescriptions at age 85 that GoodRx does not cover or does not have a coupon for. And at that point, you're paying a penalty to enroll in a Part D plan on top of the Part D plan. Am I correct? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so you no. only can, that's the other problem is you can only enroll in that standalone drug plan or Medicare Advantage plan with drug coverage in the annual enrollment period. So you could find out in January, February that you need this really expensive med, and now you've got to wait all year to get into a drug plan. So that actually happened to a client of mine recently. They decided to go without drug coverage. It'd been about five years, and now he's on a very expensive uh, in, um, insulin. So he became diabetic. And so now he's got some pretty high drug costs and looking to enroll in a plan that includes drug coverage for this year, but he's going to have you know a five-year penalty, a 60% penalty. So right. yeah, that, that's something so, that people, well, something that people may not be aware of because uh, I had a, a client that um, she was on her husband's plan. And then uh, when he retired, she took off. She didn't take the drug coverage. She didn't think that she wanted it because she didn't think that you know, she, she was at sick. <laughs> so when she did sign up for a, a Medicare Advantage plan three years later, even though it's a zero premium, she's still having to pay that drug penalty. So. A lot of people are confused at that. Well, it's a zero premium. Why am I being charged? Well, it's your penalty. Okay. Uh, one other question, then I want to jump to part B and the changes that are coming. We've got several questions about that. But somebody, uh, let's see, I missed it. Oh, is it unwise to go with a Medicare Advantage plan in your first year on Medicare? Are you allowed to go back to tra traditional Medicare after having an Advantage plan? After one year, you can you you can you can if you sign up for the Medicare Advantage year. plan to, right away? Yeah, you can try it out, and then if it doesn't work after a year, but then like Lisa said, you may be subject to underwriting after that time. So sometimes, if your health is really, I mean, really consider it, really think about it. Um, it's better, I think, to 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 start out with one if you're if you're at all considering or if you're not sure start out with one because you can always switch back so much easier. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that rule that allows that 12 month, I call it like a free look period. Like you can try yeah. it out. It's really specific. The yeah. Medicare advantage effective date has to match your original Medicare eligibility. So again, I'm going to use myself. My birthday is in June. So my Medicare eligibility will be June 1st in however many years. I don't want to think about that. And <laughs> um, so if I wanted to do that, you know, free look, my Medicare Advantage plan would have to also be June 1st of that year. That's so right. in that specific case, I could go on to a Medicare Advantage plan and any time in that first 12 months, I could choose to enroll in a Medigap plan guaranteed issue. Uh, and I think part of the reason the government does that is because Medicare Advantage plans technically are the newer of the two. They were formally passed back in 03 and we really saw them hit the market in 05. Um, so it's still somewhat new. It's it's about, uh, I think at this point, 40% of the Medicare beneficiaries in the country are on a Medicare Advantage plan. So, Okay, uh, Grace, let's go to that last slide about uh, the changes in Part D. We've got about 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure we touch upon this um, because they will be important uh, if they aren't immediately. Uh, go ahead and get to that next slide. All right, um, so first off, Marcella, why don't you d describe what's happening in the first two years? Well, the first thing that's gonna happen is of course your your uh, your uh, insulin will be $35, which, was, which is incredible. <laughs> because there are so many people that are on insulin. And uh, then after that, then in 2024, you don't have to pay anything when you're in your catastrophic uh, drug coverage. So 
those are the two things that are that are very important. In 2025, the drug costs will be capped at $2,000. Um, it's, it's unfortunate we have to wait so long, but at least at least they're working on it. I think that's that's a really good thing about yeah. that. And Lisa, why is it so important that catastrophic coverage goes to zero percent cost share? So right now, uh, and, and our, I noticed our slide had a couple of mistakes in it, but when you look at that drug coverage, there's four phases. You've got your deductible initial coverage where you're pick, typically paying a, a, a copay. You go to coverage gap where you're paying 25% retail. In catastrophic, you're still paying 5% for the remainder of the year. So right now, as it sits for this year and for next year, and for what we've seen so far since the drug plans have been out there, there's no true out-of-pocket maximum for your drug costs from year to year. So when we get to 2024, theoretically, there will be, because once you get through your deductible, your initial coverage and coverage gap, if you get into catastrophic, at that point, you won't pay any more for the remainder of that calendar year. And this whole system resets every January. Uh, if you're on Medicare right now, you may have noticed that you get these monthly statements from your Medicare Advantage plan or your Medicare drug plan. And that's really trying to help you see where you're at in those four phases. So 2024 will be the first time that we'll see there is an actual stopping point to people paying for a portion of their drug cost. And then in 2026, we mentioned that the government begins negotiating prescription drug costs. So what, what is that about? Right. So they're not going to be able to negotiate across the board, uh, at least from what I've read so far in 2026, there's going to be 10 drugs, 10 maybe of the highest price drugs that they'll look at. And each year after that, they're adding, I think, three or four drugs. So it's kind of a very slow sliding scale up. It's not going to be Medicare having the ability to negotiate across the board with all drugs that are on the market. It's going to be very specific select drugs starting in 2026. Uh, and one more thing really quick to touch on, and I'm going to go back to 2023 for this next year. So the other bullet point there is that any Part D vaccines uh, will go to a zero cost. So this has been an interesting situation because for some reason, Medicare takes the vaccine list and really splits it. If you're looking at Medicare Part B and what we consider our preventative care covered in full, there's only four vaccines on that list, which is your annual flu vaccine, your pneumonia vaccine, hep B booster if you're at risk, and now COVID. So those particular vaccines have been covered in full. If you were getting a vaccine for, say, shingles or a tetanus booster or boosting any other childhood vaccines, those have been covered, but they were covered under Medicare Part D, which in most cases meant they were subject to the drug deductible and copay. And especially the shingles vaccine, which is two shots averaging about $200 retail per shot, people felt like they were paying the whole price depending on their drug plan. So we'll see that change in 2023 where any Part D vaccines, again, the two big ones that come up are the shingles vaccine and tetanus boosters, those will now be a zero cost on any of the Part D drug plans, whether it's Medicare Advantage or standalone drug plans. All right, um, I'm gonna jump back from the changes for a minute because we've got a lot of questions still. <laughs> um, now I've got one attendee who's con I, I confused because I said in my answer that he could switch to Kaiser at least up until the end of this year at Kaiser's plan at any time because it's a five-star rated plan. That can happen at any time during the year, correct? If it's right a five-star rated plan, right? Right. So so he he only has one option during the AEP. Um, the star ratings came out a week and a half, two weeks ago, and there is going to be no five-star no five plans star. available in our market for 2023. Okay. So the two oh. carriers that were five-star this year were Kaiser and Providence, but they both lost their five-star heading into next year. Okay. Yeah. If we did have five-star rated plans next year, you, you could move into it at any, any into time. that five-star plan. If you're on one, a, yeah, if you're on a Medicare. One, one, one time, though, just one time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, here's a quick question. D does retiring qualify as a life event for purposes of getting relief from IRMA premium add-on? Yes. yes. So there's eight categories, um, you know, divorce, marriage, death, uh, work stoppage, work reduction, um, loss of income producing property, I should know these, uh, loss of employer payments. So there's very specific eight categories. What's not included in that is if you took money out of a 401k and changed your income or you had a, a inheritance or a capital gains. But certainly 
you know, either stopping work or reducing your work hours, which affects your income, that is a qualifying event that you could use that form that I was showing you. Okay. Now, Marcella, I know you have a lot of experience with the, the Medicare.gov uh, plan finder. You help people uh, navigate that all the time. We have one attendee who's put, you know, her her uh, prescription into the plan finder. The plan um, she chose said it wasn't covered and then later came to find that it was. So is that tool accurate or do you sometimes run into inaccuracies? Every once in a while we do. And in that case, I do question it. I'll, I'll go to the provider directly and ask them because it's, uh, it, it, it is. But I do, we always, we have a person that we can contact Medicare directly and, and uh, find out about that too, to have them change the plan finder. You so know. the plan finder is, is pretty accurate. Yes. In, in some cases though, there can be uh, mistakes or gaps in, particularly in that formulary and also which doctors are covered. Yeah, because it, 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 as we know, the drug plans will change. I mean, even during the year, your drug costs can change. That's the trouble with that. You may sign up with the plan and, and what it says today in six months, it, it may change. Um, we have a question. My husband is a federal retiree. He did not sign up for Part B at 65. Will he be penalized forever? Well, <laughs> as long as he's covered with a credible coverage, he, he won't be penalized. But yeah, if, if in six years he decides to sign up for Part B, he'll be penalized forever. <laughs> okay. It doesn't ever go away, unfortunately. Neither does neither does the drug penalty. They're they're <laughs> they're a lifetime mark on you. Yeah. So actually, the, the only exception to that rule is if you become uh, Medicaid eligible. Oh, that's so true. So then the late enrollment penalties drop off at that point. That's right. Um, a question regarding insulin costs. What does select insulins mean? And does Medicare cover everything beyond the $35 that people pay? So the select insulin, that terminology was really present in last year and this year's market because prior to the changes that we're seeing happening on the most recent legislation, there had been a program called the uh, um, senior Insulin Savings Program, yeah. and it was started by the previous administration. Uh, the first year was 2021. This was the second year. It was going to sunset in 2025, and it was a choice. Carriers could choose to uh, be a part of that program, and if they did, they could pick select insulins that they then capped on their formulary at $35. What happened, unfortunately, is that with all the changes with the legislation and it happening towards the end of the year, um, that the, the carriers didn't have an opportunity to uh, update all their formularies or, or change a lot of things. It was already, uh, you know, in most cases approved. So we don't have necessarily the most accurate Medicare.gov plan finder, especially when it comes to insulins. But if you see that word select insulins, usually it's it's referring to what we've been dealing with already, which is the senior savings program for insulin. Um, theoretically, the carriers, if they have an insulin on their formulary, that should be capped at $35. Uh, again, this year, they didn't have a lot of opportunity to adjust for that. We'll, we'll see what it looks like the following year. Um, regarding specialty medications that are uh, tier four or five, would it be covered on any of the Part D drug plans? Uh, they're talking about medications that cost thousands of dollars a month. Yes, well, Part D will cover it. It's just that your copay will be higher too. They, as long as it's in the formulary, it'll be covered, yes. Um, but here again, if, 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 if the copay is high, they, they don't have a choice, they have to pay more. Yeah, yeah, so tier, tier four is usually considered a non-preferred brand name. So it'll either be a percentage of the cost or a high copay, like hundred dollars. Right. The specialty drugs, generally you're going to see those between 23 to 33% of the cost. I will say I've had a handful of times where a consumer was on an oral chemo med that was anywhere from 10 to $15,000 a month. And in those cases, at least the ones that I saw, the consumer was able to go to the drug manufacturer directly okay. and apply for financial assistance wherein the manufacturer paid the client's portion of whether it was their deductible, initial costs, coverage gap portion, even the catastrophic 5%, um, which was, you know, you can imagine even at 5%, a $10,000 drug is $500 a month. So um, if you are on a really, really high drug, definitely um, go to the drug manufacturer's website to see if they offer any kind of assistance at that point. 
Somebody uh, here has a medical group whose uh, doctor belongs to that has announced that they are not going to cover regular Medicare anymore, except regular Medicare. His question is, is there an easy way to search for a new doctor? Um, I, I think the answer is you need to probably find a Medicare Advantage plan that uh, your doctor is in network for. Is that, is that a decent answer or what would you guys say? That would be a good idea. Yeah, or if, if you just ask your friends, your neighbors, I guess. But yeah, I know if, if it were me, I would I would be checking to see what plans they do take and try to. Try to yeah. So if you're if you're on original Medicare with a supplement and you like that coverage, um, then obviously and, and you prefer the coverage over the doctor, you're going to need to find a new doctor. The challenge there is going to be that a lot of our primary care doctors aren't taking new patients because they're full. Um, but it, you're more likely to find a clinic, a primary care clinic who's taking on new patients if you're going to a hospital owned clinic. So I always tell my clients focus on like the Providence, Legacy, OHSU, Adventist, because the hospitals have enough money to continue to build out more clinics, hire more doctors, where a private clinic doesn't. I mean, they're they're limited to what they can afford. Um, so if I've got somebody who wants to stick with original Medicare and a supplement and their doctor no longer wants to take it, that's what I suggest. If you want to keep your doctor, then as Marcella said, you've got to go with one of the Medicare Advantage plans that they're willing to work with because doctors can absolutely say no and not take your Medicare Advantage plan if they're not in network. That's a choice they have. Okay. And, and it's, it's um, important even within a network, say, say for instance, like Blue Cross, it has several different plans, PPOs, HMOs, and, and all that. And we're finding that the doctor in like the HMO will not take the PPO. So it's really important to, before you sign up with a plan, make sure the doctor is in that. Even, even if it's a Blue Cross plan, that doesn't mean the doctor's in the network. All right, final question, and then we're gonna have to sign off. Do any of the supplement plans, the Medigap plans include dental and hearing? No, I don't think it, I don't know if you would do. At best, like I said earlier, you may find a carrier who has discounts. So hearing aid discounts or vision discounts, um, but they don't, in, to my knowledge, and I work with a lot of them, they do not include vision or hearing or dental per se, like the routine services. So. All right. Well, with that, I think. It's time to wrap it up. This has been our longest uh, Medicare webinar ever, and we still have a few unanswered questions. Um, we'll, we can, you can email either uh, Lisa or Marcella directly with uh, those questions. Uh, they'll um, share their email addresses shortly in the chat. Um, as I said to start, we've recorded this. And we will send you, anybody who's registered for this online will get a link to the recording. So you can go back and review some of the things we've talked about. It's complicated, I know. Uh, I wrote about this for several years before I really got it. <laughs> so, and, you know, Marcella and Lisa uh, spent a lot of time in uh, continuing education and training to get up to speed on all this. So it's completely understandable why you might have questions or want to go back over this presentation. But um, thanks so much for your time. I'll say also we'll probably try to include uh, some of this chat uh, in whatever we send out. Hopefully we can we can do that. We'll, we'll work on doing that. So uh, some of the answers that have come up in, in the chat box should be included in what we send out. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Lisa and Marcella for taking the time out to provide their knowledge and expertise. Everybody have a great evening and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.